Hi, and welcome to this Xylos Cloud Chat. My name is Geert Baken. And I'm Karim Vaas. And today, Karim, we're going to talk about uh, Docker. Um, can you tell me what Docker is and how it relates to the typical virtualization techniques we have been using in the past? When looking towards virtualization, what we have is hardware, a host. On top of that, a host operating system and a virtualization layer. From there, we have multiple, many virtual machines. Each virtual machine with its own guest operating system, binaries, libraries, and the application. As a whole, it's kind of bloated. Yeah, so when you're saying bloated, indeed, every virtual machine is running a full operating system. So I'm guessing with Docker, that's not exactly the case. When we're looking towards Docker, the virtualization layer and the guest operating system, they're gone from the equation. The container, it borrows its capabilities from the host operating system and if needed adds a bit more. You still have the binaries, libraries and the application and they can be shared between the containers. Okay, so why would I use Docker? So when we're looking towards the past, a bit of, re of a recap. Previously, more traditional mindset, what did we have? Monolithic applications, a big chunk, running on physical hardware. Today, that's not really the case mostly virtual machine, less physical machines, running on a virtualization platform or even a private cloud. And what is running on top of that? Those are end-tier applications. End-tier, database layer, mm. application layer, compute, and a front-end layer. Mm. Look, looking towards what's coming, what's emerging, okay, at one point, the public and the private cloud. On top of that, we see microservices. Microservices being, okay, we have the end-tier application from earlier, we're going to split it in a lot of services, smaller services, so we can upgrade them individually or scale them individually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, does that mean that Docker is only useful in, in a microservices approach? No. We can use it in a hybrid way where we say, okay, with the end tier application, we're going to take the middle tier, the compute layer, and we're going to only split that part and leaving the database intact. Okay. Now... Um, can you tell me a little bit more about the different components in Docker and, and how they relate to each other? When looking towards a typical Docker flow, uh, we're going to have a Docker file, which is a recipe from which we can create a container. Mm -hmm. This container, we go, once built, we're going to store it in a repository. So we're going to push it towards that. And other systems, they can search that repository, pull down the container and run the container. So once we have that container built, we can run it on any system. So the concept from it works on my machine, once it builds, it will work on any machine. So looking towards development, Mac workstation, Linux workstation, Windows workstation will all work. Going towards test, quality assurance, production integration will all work nicely. Also, if it's a physical machine, bare metal, if it's a virtualization platform, private cloud, public cloud, it will work as planned where it's typically used in a continuous integration, continuous deployment environment to provide the needed agility and time to market towards the business. Okay, so I can easily build my, my Docker image on my own personal uh, system and then put it in a repository and pull it down anywhere I want. Of course, typically I'd, I'd like to put these images, these Docker containers on, on multiple systems. Uh, how do I go about uh, that? Um, Elementary approach is where we say, okay, we have a Docker host, which runs Docker on top of that, mm -hmm. and a lot of containers. Though as Silos ICT, we know, okay, production environments, there are multiple hosts for various reasons. Scalability, high availability, we just need more. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to manage them individually. That's where an orchestrator comes into play to manage them as a whole. So what are the most commonly used orchestrators out there in the field? There are several orchestrators out there. When looking towards the past, uh, they have their origin in, in clustering and so on, that are Mesos from Apache and Kubernetes, an origin with Google. Uh, they can also manage containers, but they can also manage other applications, processes, and so on. When looking towards the Docker native, that's something called Swarm, that can manage it as a whole too. When we would deploy something, we would rather choose Rancher, because it's a nice user interface where the other ones are more CLI-based. Okay. Of course, this is a cloud chat. Uh, what are my options in, in public and or even private cloud environments? When looking towards the, the public private clouds, uh, there are several past platform as a service offerings. Uh, we can start with Docker as an organization itself with its Docker cloud. It's based on an acquisition called Tutum and running on Swarm. 
which we just discussed. Looking towards Google, they also have their container services powered by Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Amazon has a similar thing, but it's proprietary, a custom in development. When looking towards Microsoft, there are two flavors. Uh, on one side, it's Swarm. On the other side, it's Mesos. But we're noticing that they tend to invest more in the Mesos part. Our own cloud container service, when we would deploy that one, that's based on Rancher to provide the ease of use. And underneath, on Azure, due to the various services we can link with. Okay, so not surprisingly, I'm particularly interested in the Rancher uh, case. Can you show us in practice how this works with a, with a demo? What we're going to show today are uh, an environment, two hosts. One is located in North Europe, one is located in West Europe. So both different regions within Azure, both isolated. So they have their own network. There is no okay. interconnection between them except for the internet. Mm -hmm. We're going to create one orchestration across those. On that, we're going to deploy a WordPress setup, database, WordPress load balancer, mm -hmm. and from Azure, a traffic manager on top so that we can load balance them across the regions. Okay, let's show this. Okay. Okay, Geert, this is the Rancher user interface. First, we're going to the infrastructure pane where we can see our hosts. Here we see two hosts, one in North Europe, one in West Europe, they both have a public IP address, so there is no private connection between the both, and they are running Ubuntu as a host operating system. And as you can see, there are several containers already deployed. Yeah, I noticed that uh, your containers are actually using private IP addresses. I'm guessing sometimes these containers have to talk to each other, even when they're running on, on separate hosts. How is that accomplished? When using Rancher, Rancher foresees in cross-host networking uh, capabilities via a component that's called a network agent, like we see here. Once a host is deployed, it comes with a network agent, and all network agents create an overlay network, which is private, isolated, and secured. When we would go to the one of the network containers, it's actually a container also, we would open the shell, we can ping the other network agent, and we see that it responds. So there is connectivity between both hosts. Okay, great. Now let's go to the catalog. The catalog is kind of like a marketplace. It can be something that's private for your organization or something public. You can see there are a lot of services. And here we're going to select Hadoop and Yarn, something that's used a lot by our analytics team for their test and labo environments, where it's really easy and fast to deploy uh, these type of environments using Rancher. Like you can see, it's just launch and Hadoop is being deployed. We're going to leave it as is for now because it's already deploying. When looking towards our applications, we see a small container called Test Logger and it's running on version 1. When we go and see what it's actually doing, it's doing a small Hello World application that's saying hello world every minute. But our development team just released a new version and we're going to upgrade it. So we're going to upgrade and say, okay, I want version two, not version one. And click upgrade. Now it's going to stop the current container. Now you can see our Initial container has been stopped and the new container has been started. Once we go to see what that's producing, we can see that the hello world is now saying, okay, I'm version two. So it's been upgraded. Now we can choose to say, okay, finish the upgrade, or in this case, now nah, I want to go back to version one. It will be rolling back. Let's go to our next example which is uh, the architecture we showed in the beginning, a WordPress demo. And here we can see uh, our stack contains of a database container, several WordPress containers, and an endpoint. So an entire application, database, compute, and our front-end layer. And there are links between the different services. So our endpoints will go to the WordPress, the WordPress will go to our database. Yeah. What are those labels I'm seeing there, MySQL and DB? Once we have a service link between the containers, we can name it. The naming will be an internal naming resolution between the services so that the WordPress uh, containers 
can connect to the database container in, with the name MySQL in this case. Okay, and I configure, I'm using that name within the WordPress configuration to actually reach my database. That's correct. Once we go towards a WordPress container, okay, let's go to the container, let's open up the shell, and we're going to ping towards our service name being MySQL. You can see that there is network connectivity and it's done via an internal uh, resolution system that's powered by Rancher. So it's an ability uh, that's provided so that a given set of services can connect to each other. So if we scale, we don't have to change every naming system and resolution system. Okay. So we just talked about scale. Let's do that. For the moment we have a scale of 2. Let's go to 4. I will notice that the service will alter itself and add additional containers. So we can see that there is uh, an additional container created. Important to know is that Rancher will do the scheduling. And with the scheduling, it will also do a kind of intelligence from which container to place on which host so that they are equally spread or when we give a certain set of uh, scheduling rules that it complies with those. As you can see now, it's also saying that it's degraded, meaning we selected four containers. For the moment, we're not running on four containers. So it's saying, okay, I need to create some more. Okay, here we can see that uh, our fourth container is now being rolled out. And it's actually running. Once we go back to the infrastructure part and look at our hosts, we can see that our WordPress demo has scaled a bit. So it's safe to say that from a business and dev perspective, it gives us more agility, yeah, even more than in the past. And from an ops perspective, it gives us a faster time uh, to market, not just for your initial release, but also for the subsequent uh, updates. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.